So today we're going to be looking at a review of the VAL draft format. Uh, this was one that overall for me was pretty successful. I had a ton of fun. Uh, it did last a long time, but I think that was uh, potentially a good thing. Uh, topped out at Mythic 27, was able to hit it all three seasons where VAL was played. A solid 61% win rate uh, and 21 trophies. Uh, of note, finished the format strong with three trophies in the last four drafts. Um, so that was pretty cool. Nice way to end it. Uh, just as a general review, uh, decks that I found to work well for me uh, personally I was generally blue-white, played it a ton of times with great success. Um, and this splash was blue-white, you know, splashing a green card. Um, it's nothing super crazy. Um, and then I did uh, enjoy playing black-white as well. And then I, I did all right with, with some of the other pairs. So they tend to be about um, where my overall win rate was. I did play black-red a reasonable amount and blue-red a reasonable amount as well. Um, so with that in mind, um, let's get to the decks. So we'll spend just a few minutes on each one of these. And the goal is just to have a general idea of what a template could look like, uh, a shell could look like for these decks. Um, you know, when this comes back around and it's, you know, draftable again, uh, which, which would be with thoughts, but regardless, it's still good to have a, an idea of the decks uh, for when you see this format again, or if you draft it in paper, you know, with, with some friends or colleagues. So Black Red was generally guarded as, as one of the top decks at the beginning of the format um, because Blood was just um, so useful. Uh, it did end up uh, being drafted a little more and, and win rates drop, but it was still in that uh, probably top tier, um, maybe tier 1.5, potentially. <coughs> Because all of the, the blood and the removal is available, there are different ways to build this. It could be a very uh, much more control or it could be a little more aggressive in, but generally a more mid-range deck that tries to get a threat down and then kills other creatures while it establishes the board presence more and, and filters out with blood worked really well. So again, rules are no rares uh, in these templates. Try and limit to just two of any particular common and one of an uncommon. And generally speaking, those uncom those commons for which there's two of uh, tended to either perform very well in the deck um, or maybe are in there for uh, the potential reasons like um, curve uh, uh, being much lower, potentially when we look at like white green, for example. Um, for this deck in particular, uh, removal uh, was plentiful uh, and reasonably strong. Uh, strongest commons were Flame Blessed Bolt uh, and then a Braid. Two of each of those, if you could get them, would be very useful. Kill many of the creatures. In the format, though, there are many bombs in Val, um, so having some catch-all removal like a Bleed Dry or potentially a Hero's Downfall, which probably isn't even as good as Bleed Dry, to be honest, because Exile is just huge on this. It's worth the, the one extra mana most of the time. It was really strong. And then having a Vampire's Vengeance when the majority of your deck uh, is made out of vampires or, or creatures that won't die from the Vengeance, like a Scavenger or a Flipped Visionary, um, it's just peak, you know, two, three, four for one value. Plus you get the blood. And then Wedding Invitation really shot up um, draft rankings once people realize just how useful, you know, an unblocked, you know, 5-5 five, five or 4-4 four, four can be. Uh, and then that, you know, big life swing uh, can really just make racing a challenge for decks against Black Red or other decks that may be able to favorably use Wedding Invitation. You know, had a density of, of vampires. Uh, so... Of note with the creatures, uh, many of them are very strong. So if you could get a Blood Tithe Harvester, this is generally regarded as one of the top, you know, two to three uh, uncommons in the set, being in a strong pair with a very good ability. And potentially if you had some ways to buy back the creature. Uh, th this version doesn't, but you could have Ecker's Awakening or maybe a Blood Fountain if, if you were getting uh, really grindy. Uh, this can just be very, very useful. And then the, the Visionary and the Suitor or just premium two and three drops, help you remain aggressive, uh, help you not run out of uh, things to do with your mana potentially, you know, flipping this, using using that to draw a card. Uh, and then the recluses aren't all-stars, but I have two of them in here because they can play very well when you have a density of blood. 
uh, and you can uh, get um, a 3-3 three, three is earliest turn 3, though it's not attacking as a 3-3 three, because three, it has to flip at that point. Though with some shenanigans, you may be able to get a um, you know early 1 drop and, and attack with a suitor and blow in turn 3 and, and maybe get blockers out of the way and then flip it. So there's some, some fun, fancy things you can do there. And there are other cards you could put into this shell, obviously, but uh, these are cards that just perform very well. And, and generally being commons, you could get, you know, two copies of many of these. So Celebrance was a great top end. Uh, if you're going to play something above four, uh, that's not a bomb. Uh, Celebrance is where you really want to be, because oftentimes with this deck, you can stop it, you know, four to five mana, and then choose your blood to, to filter your draws to just get more gas and play it. Um, Oftentimes you still want it to be at 17 lands. Uh, there probably could be times to play 18 if you had like a, a Tox Thrill or Dreadfast Demon, something at the top end that you really wanted to, to hit. But you can filter away some of these lands that you don't need later in the game, even mid to late game, with Blood. Uh, that, that was all right. You just didn't want to miss your drops. You wanted to be able to curve out to, to four or potentially five if you could. Oh, very strong deck. Uh, played very well against... Many of the other good decks in the format as well, like Blue, White, and Blue, Red. In particular, if you had one or two Vampire's Vengeances, um, you could just make Blue, White not be a tough matchup if you could uh, get the board such that you can kill so many of their creatures. Because in Val, they don't come back as creatures on the Disturbed side. They just come back as enchantments. Uh, so it was a strong deck, enjoyable to play. That's, that's Black, Red. My favorite deck and the deck I played most in the format was uh, Blue White. And similar to Blue White Mid Night Hunt, uh, there's just tons of grind attrition this deck can have. Uh, but somewhat unlike the Mid Night Hunt version, uh, this can be a very tempo oriented deck. You can get on board with a good one drop into a good two drop, and then you can just, you know. Take care of business with removal spells. Uh, if you, We don't have Chill of the Grave in this version, but uh, if you did have Chill of the Grave, you can just tap their stuff down and keep attacking through. Um, but the, the gold cards and the commons are very strong in these colors as well. So made it very easy um, oftentimes to, to find and play two Ministers and two Lantern Bears because they weren't put nearly as highly as they probably should have. And oftentimes, you know, your Diver Scobs or Lunar Rejections, which are probably... Diver Scob, you know, is a top five, if not top ten, but probably top five, uncommon in the set. The Lunar Rejection is probably in the, the top fifteen, um, and sometimes those would even wheel, which is just wild. Uh, and then also you had some ways to to make racing a challenge, you know, some instant on life gain from the ancestors, uh, potentially having a Brian Comer that you'd put, you know, one or two enchantments on to generate many um, spirits that could attack or block creatures without trample and and helps you just keep going through the air and attacking some cute stuff you can do with the deck is a serpentine ambushing like a storm chaser drake to draw a card and make a favorable um attack or, or block if you needed to um ambushing a, a geist is also it's not a card you you necessarily seek out but but if you get one and and you think you can be kind of cheeky with it i did play really well with those two cards in particular uh and then the two weren't generally strong in this format on the common side, but honestly, I did not mind having a, a drug skull infantry or two. Um, it gave me some late game when I could put it on, you know, an ancestor, you know, if it died, uh, and, and put that on four to just really make it a tougher the opponent with that life swing. Um, it just gave me things to do uh, to keep the, the aggression on and, and the tempo going. Land is great on a comer, an ancestor, you know, really anything that doesn't already have flying or if you needed to on a drake to draw a card uh, and pump up its power toughness some and then removal generally speaking um was pretty good with retribution it would make it tough for an opponent to race you uh you'd think you know oh, i'm not sure if i want a fierce retribution in a deck that's going to be very aggressive i want to be getting attackers either way but because of a lot of the flying you can make it so that you can generally still attack through what the opponents are doing and if they try and race you you have a, a two mana interaction that is going to kill the creature, which, which is just so nice. Uh, and then imprisonment did make it so you could tag through on the ground if you needed to, with like an ancestor, a comer, something like that. And then this again, like black red, is very low um, 
in terms of mana values, very um, heavy on the, the ones and the twos, and then some threes. Those that are higher costs, scattered thoughts, uh, you, you never really minded playing this um, if you were at parity or ahead on board, because you're likely going to get, you know, one, maybe more than one card in the grave that has Disturb. Then you're going to get things to your hand that help you set up to, to finish the game. So it was a very strong deck. This is a shell that I'd be happy to have even without any rares. Uh, the many of the, the rares were strong in these colors as well. And again, probably want to lean towards 17 lands. Though you don't really have much blood, you might get some from an imprisonment. Um, so it makes it a little tougher to, to get out of being flooded. Um, you did have some ways with some incidental card draw with the rejection or the scattered thoughts or maybe even a drake. Um, oftentimes still be all right. Um, and it wasn't so low to the ground, you'd oftentimes see yourself playing 15 or 16 lands, but uh, if you got that type of version, uh, it could play well as long as you had enough interaction, like some chill from the graves at three to, to tap stuff and draw cards. So Blue Black uh, definitely fell down from Grace from, from Midnight Hunt down to, to Val. Uh, but it was still reasonable, but it was definitely a, a Tier 2 deck and not a, a Tier 1 deck. Uh, and all of that was because it was really dependent on getting the exploit creatures, and then those cards actually wanted to be exploited. Um, and sometimes, you know, the good creatures like the Fell Stingers, the Violum Eggs, were going to be drafted um, really in, in any other blue deck, because blue has exploit creatures, or any other black deck, because it's just good to draw cards and have a lot, uh, Death Toucher hang around. So it did make it a little tougher for this deck to come together. But oftentimes you could do some some neat stuff with, you know, killing other creatures um, and then dropping a Rot Tide um, and either like exploiting like a Doom Dissenter, Wretch Throng, um, a Lantern Bearer, or if you're really living the dream, you know, the, the Bible Meg. It get rid of the opponent's potentially last creature uh, and still have a strong board presence for yourself. Um, one thing that you probably could have more than one of if it broke right, you had enough creatures and exploiters. Is Dying Dying Malice. It played really well as long as you hold full control um, with doing like a, a Diver Scob or a Rot Tide Gargantua um, or even the, the four drop exploiter if you had enough good spells uh, and just Undying Malice on that creature so it, it exploits itself the first time and then it come back, comes back and exploits something else so you get its effect twice. Uh, it could be big game there especially if you have some good cards you want to you know, get out of the grave if you ran the four drop, or if you want to just clear their board, you know, with doing Diver's Cup twice or Gargantua twice. Um, but this deck, it wasn't quite able to play the aggressive game uh, unless it really curved out, you know, Bear into like a, a Skull Scob into an Egg into an Exploiter, um, which could be done, and, and it's tough to come back from that. Uh, but a lot of this with having timely removal, having some uh, incidental card draw off like the Chill and the Lunar Rejection. And then uh, it wasn't able to quite take advantage of getting stuff in the graveyard as well as like a blue white was. So like you were fine with scattered thoughts and the thirst, but uh, they weren't big game like they were in like blue white with all the disturbed creatures. It was a deck that was all right if it came together, but oftentimes you did need to have the uncommons, you know, like the skull scob, you know, fell stingers, bilum eggs, uh, to really make it tick or even rares. If you could get um, some of the good rares like a necro duality. Um, some of the, the black bombs or, or blue bombs that are higher up in the main value. Uh, it, it could play well, but it was still a, a tier 2 deck usually. Okay. Blue-red was a deck that, uh, generally speaking, played in that tier 1.5 to tier 1. Um, it could do well with a lot of commons, which was really cool, um, but sometimes the uncommons like the Wandering Mines, you know, diver scobs, you know, could, could really put it over the top. But a lot of this is common base, which is really nice. Uh, ideally, you're playing a low to the ground deck, uh, and it did come to be that oftentimes you could play a version that had the flame breathers and the ancestral angers, um, and, you know, could just target your drake with, with like an anger and draw a card, deal damage, draw another card from the anger, do some cute stuff. Uh, if you were low enough mana value, you could play Reckless Impulse into cards. Uh, if you really needed stuff to come together, if, if somebody was fighting you for, for like the angers, someone was fighting you for some of the removal, 
Uh, this deck was a little tougher um, to navigate. Um, oftentimes you could pivot into having more like chill from the graves and balance spells, ways to interact in that way, but you need to be high on interaction and then have just enough creatures that can actually do stuff because you're not going to be able to do all 20 points of damage or um, forbid you face white, black, and they have life gain. You know, more than that, you know, just flame breathers and pecking in for, for one a turn in the air with like a lantern bear. But it was a deck that could come together if you had enough interaction and enough uh, creatures. So like Wandering Mind was was your top card that um, oftentimes you could get a little later because people maybe didn't value blue-red quite as highly as they should have as a deck. Um, but the, the trouble is that this isn't very splashable because you need to have a density of, of spells and putting it in like in a, a blue-white, you're oftentimes going to miss with that or even like a, a blue-green or blue-black. Um, so if you went with the early one or mine, you're hopeful you're going to get and stay in this deck. But the, the angers were good, the, the bolts and the braids, two top, unco two top commons uh, were super strong. And then you did like lantern bears to be able to put something in the air, even if it's just a, a dinky flame river coming at 2-4 uh, that can attack and, and push through some damage. Um, the Racking Tour wasn't super strong, but it was nice if you had a heavy spell version like this deck shell has. Because um, so many of these are instants, you can flip it and then play stuff on your opponent's turn, um, which could play out really well. A, a note, um, oftentimes you would be fine with a Ruth, which is a rare uh, in this deck, but uh, you'd really want to try and avoid playing Counter Magic, even like Syncopate, because it's kind of a dead card if, if you reveal it uh, for the Ruth, you have to discard it in the hand. And then some of the card draw didn't play as well with the Ruth, um, if you need to play it at instant speed. Um, so it would adjust the deck some, and... Honestly, my best versions didn't have a Ruth. They were very low to the ground. You know, multiple flame breathers, land bears, epicures, and just low, low mana value spells or tempo plays like like chill. But yeah, you could play a sixteen uh, land version if you had enough of the angers, um, enough other incidental card draw. Uh, but oftentimes this could be seventeen if you had um, a reasonable amount of blood. So like if you had a celebrants at five or you had multiple epicures. Uh, you'd probably be fine with, with 17 lands. Okay, White Red played all right, um, but it is definitely not in, in the top tier. Um, and a lot of it was uh, dependent on what uncommons you could get. If you could get, you know, your Waltzer Suitor, uh, Quartermaster at the top to go with, you know, like Visionary and, and Twin Blade. Initially, you could play an aggressive uh, deck, and you could potentially even get down to 15 or 16 lands, but the version we have here isn't leaning into to one, two, and, and some three drops. Um, it's a little uh, tempo-y to mid-range, where you've got the, the Q removals. Most of your car, most of your spells are going to be removal uh, to clear the way, ideally, of blockers so you can keep attacking. You know, use Minister to pump up some other creature. Um, and swing and ideally it's like a, a twin blade geist to take him into the double strike or you know a trampler or flyer or something like that but yeah uh, most of the spells are removal to clear the way um, funnily enough you didn't mind playing a vampire's vengeance even though it it could kill your ministers um, because the other creatures that kills you know like that the geist or infantry you'll just you know put those on a flyer and, and go to town with double strike or plus two plus two um, or it won't kill some other creatures which was really nice um, so it was a deck where you needed to see enough removal and, and enough of the somewhat contested cards, like the bolts and the braids and the ministers, um, and then enough of the uncommons to really make it work. But uh, it could play all right. It could make some of the decks that dirtle around a little bit um, kind of struggle. Um, but it wasn't a deck I was looking to get into. It's more often than not you'd start out heavy in red or, or heavy in white. And then you just wouldn't see, you know, another good, you know, color to pair with it. You might get a, a waltz or late, you know, like pick nine or eight or something. And you might say, okay, well, maybe I'll try, you know, white, red. See if we can get there. Um, and if, if you see some more of the uncommons and enough of the removal, oftentimes you could. Yeah. Black, green was not a deck I, I really wanted to be in. It just... It was kind of junky. I, I will say it did allow you to to splash some if you get a couple Weaver Blossoms and maybe even a Taxidermist. Uh, and oftentimes you needed to because it was 
uh, just tough to find, um, like good enough removal. I mean, the black's obviously there, but uh, this tends to play uh, a mid-range to long game where, you know, you can find your child of the pack to use splash for and activate it, you know, a couple times. You know, you can stabilize enough to get to your Flourishing Hunters to gain the life or Grizzly Rituals to, to kill the creature. And this wasn't a deck that generally overran the opponent. You just tried to find value where you could, uh, like the the experts, uh, try and get some two-for-ones, or crawl or stuff like that. Um, and you could play the Butts game, you know, Catapult Fodder, flipping over to Catapult Captain. Uh, and it was a way to have Reach and end the game, but oftentimes it just didn't come together super well because uh, you've got to have three of those creatures that haven't been traded off in combat or been killed by a removal spell. And you have to have enough time to actually uh, be stabilizing and, and then be able to get rid of your creatures to do that. Um, so it just wasn't a deck where I really wanted to play it. It wasn't a, a place I really wanted to be in the format. Um, that being said, if you were going to play it, um, some of the cards that were useful, Bleed Dry, obviously, and then the Hunters to get you back in the game if, if your early cards that weren't super strong um, against some of the other things that Color Bears could be doing. Um, the life gain was nice. Uh, you're very susceptible to flyers in both these colors. Like, if you get a Bram Worm or, or even two, ideally, that'd be great. And oftentimes you're using removal on, on flyers. Unless you get an early start, your opponent stumbles, and then you might be able to tempo them out, but that wasn't usually what this deck did. Exceptions are if you dropped a, a Lumbernaut on turn four, uh, and you actually had, you know, like, Gluttonous Guest or Weaver, things like that that you'd played before that, then you could be the aggressor, but oftentimes that's not what you were doing. And as soon as they remove the Lumbernaut, you know, you're back to just being more defensive and more playing for a long game. So, again, if you really see the removal and you're just finding nothing else to, to pair with black or you started off with green, you know, got scammed and, you know, went down the green path, you could add some black to it, but this isn't a color pair you really wanted to seek out. It didn't tend to play very well in the format. Red Green, on the other hand, uh, did perform better <laughs> uh, compared to its Midnight Hunt version. Um, it, it was probably a tier two, one and a half, tier one and a half type deck. It started the format out, you know, close to tier one, but a lot of that was just, you know, people were gun shy about drafting it because it was so bad in Midnight Hunt. Um, but just the green usually didn't get there, so you had to just get some good red and, and find enough red that works with werewolves and find the right werewolves. And, and you could play this deck, but um, some of the cards, like you wouldn't necessarily want to pick a pick one pack one pack song pup, even though pack song pup, even though it's very strong in this deck because it's only good in red green. You're not going to get enough wolves and and green X generally to to make it useful. And again, like all the other red decks, you're looking for bolts and abrades wherever you can get them. And you can play Wolf Strike if you need to. It's probably preferable uh, compared to like a you know, combat trick that's pump spell based uh, in this particular deck because you do have a density of wolves and uh, your stuff is going to be kind of bigger. Um, but yeah, you do want to try and um, play a more mid range. You know, you can start early if you can, you know. Snarling Wolf is in here because it's great to go Snarling Wolf into Pack Sung Pup or Snarling Wolf into, into Ridge Wolf and make it tough for your opponent to, to like, race you because you can pump this. This will be a 3-2 now. Um, so those are useful. And then you do have a pretty decent top end if you can get there. So, like, having Blo Weaver Blossoms is really good to help you, you know, play your Bramble Worms or Hunters or Infection Experts to turn earlier. Uh, if your opponent stumbles and this flips, you know, even two turns earlier, which can be fantastic. Uh, and then there are roles for Child of the Pack. It wasn't the strongest um, overall, but it could take over a game if not contested, if not killed. Uh, but a lot of these were uncommons that you needed to have to, to make the deck really work outside of the, the red removal. It's like you really wanted the Bramble Worms, Infection Expert, Child of the Hunt, Child of the Pack, sorry, Luring Suitors. To make it really tick. But you could build this with, with many commons, which is why uh, if it's uncontested, it, it could be a good deck to play. And then white-black is a deck that many people are not going to miss 
because it was just so grindy. Um, it was just life gain and like Heron of Hope giving even more life and then bringing creatures back with courier bats and getting like with gluttonous guests. Um, it is just uh, to the point where you could even play point of discussion and it was really good in this deck. It was one of the top commons because you didn't mind the, the life loss. You like the blood token. You like the two cards for three mana. So it played really well to help you just refill your hand and you know, keep killing opponents creatures, keep trading off to bring them back or just to, to race them, you know, in the air with like a, a hair on a hope or, or bats, for example. It was such a grindy, annoying deck to play against, to be honest with you. But it could be fun to play as long as you have the time you can devote to it. But oftentimes this would start with um, being in black and then seeing, you know, some late, you know, ministers or heralds of hope coming around um, or like a late purifier uh, and just kind of speculating on the color pair. And then in the second pack, you see some white and enough black to where you're like, okay, well, you know, I'm getting the late pointed discussions. I'm seeing them in pack two. I'm seeing some bleed dries, some good removal. And I'm just going to play a super grindy long term game. Uh, a concern with this deck um, is because you could get enough blood and enough card draw that. You could potentially deck if your opponent's not drawing more cards or blooding more than you. You needed to find some way to, to kill them or else you spent 30 minutes and gone through your whole deck and, and are at probably like 30 life, but you know they're at 10 life and you just, you just don't win. So um, ideally, if you could open some of the stronger um, cards to give you like evasion or bombs on, on the black side uh, as rares, then you'd love to have them in this deck. But... Uh, if you're not doing that, then it's just going to be grind them down, try and get them with some flyers, um, or even like a flipped, you know, Bloodseeker. Could be really nice. And then blue green is a color pair that um, didn't perform nearly as well um, compared to its Midnight Hunt version, which is unfortunate. It's fun to do some some kooky stuff with it, but was kind of discovered and, and Sam Black did a lot of this and others did too was you just wanted to have a huge density of creatures and just a few spells and oftentimes interaction spells to help you like push through with your creatures and the ways to take advantage of a ton of creatures going to the graveyard like your vile spawn spiders like your mold graph millipedes um, and you could eventually even use like a, a screaming swarm with a ton of creatures whether they're they're spiders or something else to just mill your opponent out so it was just a grinding, a tr grindy, attrition-y deck. Um, you could oftentimes even play kind of clunky, usually not good cards like, you know, Gutter Skulker to just tack for three a turn while you're just holding the board down with your, you know, four fours or, you know, maybe like an eight eight millipede, you know, Worms, Hunter, stuff like that. Cards that they don't necessarily want to see killed like a Lantern Bear or a Spore Crawler. Um, so you could do neat stuff like that. Um, but the thing is the density of this deck was need to be with the green creatures um, because they need to be able to clog up the board on the ground. Um, so you can attack them in the air or talk through them black with a scutter, a gulking, a gutter skulker. Um, so it was just, it was a weird deck to play, um, but it did have some game. If you could trade off enough and just have more creatures at the end than your opponent if you haven't just stalled the board out. Key cards, you know, obviously Lantern Bear is great because you want stuff to go to your graveyard. You can give some big chonker like a Mariner or a Fortune Hunter or Brainborn Flying. And those are oftentimes the ways that I would win with this deck if I didn't deck them out with a Screaming Swarm or just overrun them with a ton of spiders. Um, or you could uh, play well with the Spore cards because it's going to trade with many creatures with three power and then just give you another card to, to replace itself, which was nice. Everything else was somewhat replaceable, though you did one ways to de-incentivize de de attacking. So even like Scorpions, even some generally not good cards like Sharp Tutor that helped shore up them beating me with Flyers uh, was really useful with this type of deck. So again, it's not really where you wanted to be, but you could make it work if you had to. And then the... The last deck of the format was white green, which wasn't nearly as strong um, as its mid counterpart. And uh, Coven worked well. 
uh, training did not generally work well. That The way you could get training to potentially work is a super low to the ground version. So like the one that I've got here, it tended to be the most successful in the format. It was an aggressive deck with some tempo components rather than like a, a mid-range version that is what training maybe would have been if you really leaned into the training. So you're looking at tons of one drops, you know, you want the ministers, you want the snarling wolves. Um, I kind of broke the rule on two of a common because you can get massive mites and they're so useful because they give you trample so your creatures can just keep attacking and take out a creature and deal damage. Um, and that's what you want to do. You, you want to play creatures and just attack with them, turn them sideways, keep them alive with massive mites, adamant wills, get them pumped up more with nurturing presence to get a flyer on board uh, as well. And even some of the cards that were not generally good, like Donheart Disciple, really shine on this deck because, you know, almost all your creatures, you look at humans, 10 of them were humans, which was super nice. Um, so you oftentimes would have this as a 3-3 three, three or 4-4 four, four attacking in the early turns. And that does help turn on, like, your trainees or even, like, your griff riders that are generally not good, but if you're attacking every turn and you have the, the pump to keep doing that, could play well in this particular deck. And if you're going to have any 4 drops and still play 15 lands, you need to have some ways to, to draw cards like Spore Crawler. It has to be a good, or Resistance Squad, it has to be a good 4 drop. And really Dormant Grove uh, would probably be the best 4 drop. It's not a rare that you would have in this deck. It's going to keep pumping your creatures up. Um, and you can even flip it as soon as you can um, to give you another creature to attack with. So. It's not where you wanted to be in white green, but if you played this, you know, don't get lured in with the the four and fives and the six drops. Yeah, Brain Worm's great and Fortune Hunter's great, but in this deck, you'd rather have, you know, the Donhart Disciple, the Minister, the Spore Crawler, the, you know, pump spells and just keep attacking before your opponent can stabilize. Because uh, you don't really have blood in these colors to fix. You don't want to go to, to a mid to long game or else uh, you're probably going to lose because there's not strong flyers uh, in white outside of a couple and there's not flyers in green. So this is the way you want to play white green if you were forced to play it. So those are the, the decks for Val. Um, when we see it again, hopefully um, this helps helps you play it well. well. Thanks so much. If you thought some versions of Timbo should be different or you wanted to by your own thoughts, just feel free to comment.